reggae, th well, the reggae thing had started with us, you know, like I said, when I was a student in Liverpool, because actually, you know, what Don Letts said is true, you know, when punk started, people didn't have, you didn't want to play rock records, because um, there wasn't really anything else to play, I mean, you could play, there was, you know, various singles that people could get play, you know, but, um, so a lot of reggae got played. But reggae was already had already made its mark, you know. I mean, it wasn't universally loved. In fact, you know, our um, Nigel, our guitar player, was a funny guy. I mean, he likes reggae, yeah, you know, you know, but um, not as much as say JC and Chris and I did. And we'd stick stuff on in the van sometimes, and you go, "Oh, great, we're listening to hymns again." Um, because yeah, so <laughs> when someone's waffling on about Jar Rastafari it is a little bit like listening to hymns but uh, it wasn't all like that and then and then actually um, well by the time he came around doing the last album I was listening to quite a lot of like Congolese well, Zaire music and stuff out of Nigeria like Sunny A Day mm -hmm. Was he a motor yours? Like Charlie Gillett as well? Got yeah I did um, yeah. I did a one of those radio ping pongs with Charlie, and it was voted one of the most popular shows he'd done of the year, the year I did it. Um, and funny enough, I played the Land Rad Cowboys, the song that they did where we used the Spanish singer, the Mexican guy who sang on it, and uh, Charlie was blown away. He said, oh, My God, you know, how come I've never heard this? You know, and it's, it's really beautiful, you know. And it was, you know, because all these Finnish guys are playing, you know, squeeze boxes and, you know, there's even umpath stuff in there. It's very, very mariachi. And, um, but no, on the last album we did a track called Going West and Chris had written a song and it, it kind of never really felt like it was going anywhere for me when he was playing it. And one, the one instrument I can play a bit of is bass. So I was kind of, a, after rehearsal one day, I was fooling around with the bass and I was saying, I was thinking, because I quite liked the lyric that he'd written. So I thought, well, we could try it another way. And I was laying this kind of um, slightly kind of Zaire, Sam McGuana kind of bass line, you know, doom, 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 that kind of thing. And uh, it ended up being becoming Going West, which is what we called the English version of, of the last album. But no, we, you know, we were always quite keen on experimenting with various things. I mean, these days, you know, I'm a, a huge fan of people like Rashid Taha, uh, Manu Chow. I like, I love what he did with um, Amadou and Mariam. In fact, you know, I was kind of amazed at all these things they're talking about. The, you know, the decade roundup and all this, that no one's actually, everyone's kind of giving this, got very excited because Damon Albarn did a track on the last time I did in Mariam and then kind of co-produced one of the tracks. But the real excitement, the real story in that lies with the first album they did with Manny Chow. It was like their 15th album or something and they'd done in their career, but the, the one that broke them and it was the biggest selling African record of all time, Dimon Shabam Akub. And like uh, Manu brought these techniques to, you know, African music, which it's kind of like, well, why the hell shouldn't they be in there? You know, you got an African track, well, I'll drop a mariachi band horn section on top of that, sounds great. People have to let go, you know, and it, a lot of people in the kind of world music community were kind of very like, Mm, I don't know, you know, it's, well, I like their earlier stuff, you know, when they were kind of plucking on one string in a cupboard somewhere in Bamako, you know, or this, that, they're in a nice shiny studio, it's sport. It's a fantastic record. I mean, by anybody's standards, it's a fantastic album, you know, and you're either open to music or you're not. You know, I can be open to I can be open to the fact that bands come out of reality TV shows. I just don't have to like them, okay? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'll put it this way. Girls Aloud aren't the same as Susan Boyle. You know, Girls Aloud have worked with 
witty songwriters interested in new techniques they've actually sort of done other things okay they're not I'm not going to go out and buy their records but you know if I hear their track on the radio I know it's them because there's a kind of certain mm-hmm. stamp to them much the same way as you knew when you heard Sweet on the radio you know um, Blockbuster Blockbuster <laughs> yeah and you've got don't forget you've got bloody hell Pointer Sisters well yeah you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, you could argue. I mean, there's always been people manipulating artists and making music. There always has been. But a lot of times what came out of it was like original, okay, original material, you know, stuff that was penned by, from the Brill Building or something like that, you know. what? But to, I don't know, you know, I just find it very difficult. Because we all sent back to Elvis when he came out and did That's All Right Mama. And in the end they got him doing... Il Mundo or something like yeah. that, you know. And uh, Tommy Steele. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've got a great Tommy Steele story. <laughs> Not about a little white bull, is it? <laughs> no, uh, Guy Pratt's dad. You know Guy Pratt, the bass player? No. Oh, nice. uh, maybe Guy Pratt's someone you ought to have on this. He's doing a one-man show as well. Oh. Uh, it's been very successful. Um, but he's played bass with... He was Pink Floyd's bass player for a long time. Young guy. I like they're all done. Oh, yeah. He's done right there. But no, the, the Tommy said when he was in Singing in the Rain. Do you know that story? No, go on then. Oh, apparently. Is it rude? Yeah. Oh. I don't know. We'll yeah, put this. Oh, you can have it for posterity anyway. Oh, oh, he, was, he was very unpopular. What was his real name? Tommy Still? Tommy Knocker, I don't know. But, <laughs> but he was very unpopular with the crew because he, he was a bit of a, you know, I think he's you know, a bit of an old school horror. And they had this huge water thing, because for the singing in the rain, the finale, you know, they have this huge tank, which would create the rain, real water coming down on stage, but he'd dance in and all. And all the crew would piss in it. <laughs> <laughs> so every night, every night he was dancing under a shower of piss, you know. Obviously diluted, but he never knew, and it was like, for old Tommy, but he didn't know that. Uh-huh. He does now. He does now, yeah. <laughs> oh dear. That was great, Nick. Thanks. Um, lovely interview and lovely to meet you again. Um, well, it's a pleasure. I really enjoyed that. And uh, catching up on the Joan and Louis stories as well. And yeah. I never finished any of that one. Oh, well, just as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Louis. <laughs>